time. Right, so everything you ever did, you did before your kid. You learned to read and you rode your bike before them, you learned to cook and you drove a car before them. Everything except tech, that is, because that's the one thing that they were born into that we simply weren't. So all the stuff, the journey through childhood is of course the same. So all of those milestones, the cognitive and the emotional development, and all the, the ways that we parent them, we kind of encourage them to use their imagination, and we get them to, you know, to give them support and, and get them to think about things. But the one thing that is different today is the fact that all of this happens with a backdrop of technology that is ubiquitous. Our most recent research at Internet Matters found that 87% of kids have access to a portable device, and that's before they're aged four years old. So, yeah, they will play games just like you did. But the way they play will be different. They will make friends, for example, that may not go to their school or even live in their town. They can play with them digitally around the world. They will interact socially, just like you did, but they may never have to utter a word in order to have a meaningful social connection. They will get crushes, just like you did. But these may be played out online through pictures and messages. And just like you, they will face challenges. But these challenges may be difficult because the bullying that you experience, for example, they may need to experience, but this time they can't get rid of the bully because it's something they carry around in their pocket. Now, to understand the way the technology is affecting these milestones, it's key to, to understand what the metric for how social media sites and platforms measure success. And the metric is simply time spent. The longer you spend on these platforms, the better it is for them. That's why if you're watching um, a series, like on a video screening platform, do you notice how the next episode begins before the last one has even finished rolling their credits? That's because they want to keep you hooked. They want to keep you kind of losing track of time. Because if you lose track of time, you stay on longer. And if you stay on longer, the better it is for them. Now, what we're seeing in some ways because of this is this need for, for media to understand how to use behavioral instincts to get people hooked. So we have this situation now where there's this merger between behavioral science and computer science. And I think it's precisely this merger that belies a lot of the, the behavior that parents see and worry about in their kids. Now, of course, marketeers have used psychology for years to motivate behavior. But the difference is this. The information that we have today is a lot more detailed and a lot more nuanced. And the computing power we have today means that reams of information can be processed at a ridiculously fast speed. And detailed information can be processed in real time and fed back to you. So it's a lot more persuasive, a lot more difficult to resist. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that psychology, of course, is still used to help people, to better them. But when behavioral scientists are trying to answer the question of how do we get people to stay online as long as possible, they're not trying to ensure ultimate well-being, but rather optimal engagement. Now, to see how this works, what I want to do is I want to break down uh, this into sort of the three areas that when I speak to parents, seem to concern them the most. I want to speak about um, gaming, socializing, and bullying. All right, let's talk about playing games. Now, again, this is a key part of, of development as a child. You know, when your kid plays, they learn about rules and how to interact with friends. And, and playing is really good, of course, because that's where they learn new stuff to master skills. Now, boys especially have evolved to seek out competency. The evolution kind of rewards them for getting good at stuff, literally through their biochemistry. So it kind of works something like this. Imagine there's a kid and they're trying to get a ball into a hoop and they throw the ball and it hits the backboard. 
They get that little pang of excitement. And then they throw the ball again. And this time, it hits the rim and circles it. So it's even closer. And then, boom, they throw it and it goes in. And they get this amazing rush of dopamine. It's rewarding them. So they feel like they're mastering something. They're becoming more competent. And they're for incentivized to keep doing it. Now, as they do it, they get better. So then they get all the, the social incentives because their friends notice. And all of a sudden, they say, well, you're really good at this. And then maybe they make the, the team at school school, so their social status increases. And this feeds in to their identity, their self-worth, their self-esteem. And you know what? All the exact same stuff happens online. You know, if you're playing an online game, it too dishes out rewards, it too ranks you in relation to your peers, it too allows you into kind of special parts of the game that not everyone has access to. But there's a critical difference. When you're playing a game, those dopamine boosts are designed to be given to you at precisely the right time to make sure you get hooked, to make sure you can't get off. So this is a case of, of biology being used against us, being used to keep us hooked to these games. And, and I think that's one of the worrying things that, yes, you know, ever since games have been out, people have said, well, come on, you know, compulsion has always been a part of game. We've worried about it since we used to play Pac-Man and Atari. But the difference is this. Back in the day, the compulsion was kind of a side effect of the gaming. It wasn't an intentional element of game design. That's where it's different today. And that's where it becomes a bit more insidious. All right, I want to speak now about socialization. Now, socialization is the same today as it ever was. We want to feel part of a group. We want to feel connected. We don't want to feel like we're unable to join or reject it in any way. We want to seek out social relationships. All of that's the same. The way that it's different, though, is where we're seeking out those social relationships. These are being played out online. So we know that adolescents um, are, are very invested in seeking peer validation. And it's interesting because it's precisely at the same age where this peer validation becomes really important that they also get their hands on technology and start engaging in social media. And so all of a sudden, all of that stuff they would have done offline, you know, seeing how they compare to others, seeing how they're liked, connecting, feeling visible, that's now being played out online. And they have information, up-to-date information on what others think about them. And social media sites know this, which is why notifications become really important. And let's be clear here, notifications don't just tell you when you have a new message. They tell you when someone else has posted something, how many likes you've got, they get you to compare with them. They constantly kind of put you in this situation where you feel at the same time very exposed, but also beholden to kind of engage. You know, it's this economy of attention that everyone speaks about. Um, and, and kids, very early on realize that there's a social currency in being seen and being out there. So they can never really rest from the question of how do others see me? Um, in a study we did recently, we looked at um, what kids posted online. And one of the stats that came out of it was, I think it was well over a third of kids said that they wouldn't even dream of posting unless the picture was absolutely perfect. Perfect. Now, as a psychologist, if I wanted to create an exercise in poor self-esteem, I would do this. I would get a kid, take a bunch of pictures of themselves. I'd then get them to look through at the ones that weren't great and get rid of them. The one that was the least worst, get them to sit down and perfect it. You know, go on a, an app where they could edit out skin imperfections or change lighting or just all that stuff they don't like about themselves. Then I'd get them to think of a cool hashtag, and then I'd get them to post the picture and sit back and wait. And if they don't get enough likes, I'd get them to start over again. And that's precisely the thing that kids feel compelled to do day in and day out. And why do they feel compelled? Because a lot of psychology goes into making them feel compelled. From those red dots notifying you, to, to the pings, to the pull down and refresh menus. All that stuff is there to remind you. And, and let's be clear, again, it's not just rewards. We know that it's the way that we give rewards that matters. So if I want to strengthen a behavior, rewards are great. But intermittent rewards, 
Well, they're even better because when you don't know when the next like is coming, who it's coming from, or how many you're going to get, you keep on checking just in case. These technologies are very engaging. So telling your kid to just get off their phone doesn't quite begin to capture how difficult it is for them. Finally, I want to speak about bullying. Again, I think when I talk to parents, this tends to be one of their top concerns. And look, you know, a lot of people say, well, look, bullying is the same as it ever was. And you're right. In many ways, it is. That feeling of threat and being vulnerable and that victimization is absolutely the same. But there are some key differences. I think, firstly, because when bullying happens online, it can happen anywhere, it means you never feel safe. You literally carry the bully around you wherever you go, in your house, in your room, wherever you are. Secondly, because of the anonymity in the way that cyberbullying happens, it means that it can escalate, it can become meaner, faster, because bullies can hide behind that anonymity. Thirdly, because information can be disseminated and disseminated widely, it no longer feels contained. All that, that shaming that comes with bullying, it's no longer in front of a small audience. It can now be in front of a global audience. And, and finally, because from the bully's point of view, they don't see their victim, then the empathy that you hope would kick in when they see the effects, that doesn't really happen. So, what do we do about this? How do we make sure that our kids become more digitally resilient and, and navigate the online world that we never had to? Well, I think there's a few things we can do. I think number one, get them to think critically. They don't have to be passive consumers of this stuff. Get them to think about why a person posts a picture, what's the meaning behind it. Get them to think about when those notifications come up, what the thinking is behind it being a red dot as opposed to anything else. Get them to consider if they're being manipulated to stay on games, to stay on apps, by these rewards, by these buzzings. If they become more active and understanding, how their behavior is being manipulated, they're less likely to fall prey to it. Secondly, get them to discuss their digital identity. Um, you know, th there's a difference between the self and the selfie. You know, the real world and the online world. And our kids are developing their identities online. And look, developing an identity and, and getting others to see it is normal. But ask them, is it normal that we're getting validation for those identities from people that don't even know us? Understanding digital identity is key. Thirdly, get them to curate their consciousness. What our kids engage with online is just as important as what they put in their bodies physically. So get them to think about what it feels like when you look at a post that makes you feel less than. What it feels like when you play a game that, that affects your nervous system, your ability to sleep. You know, there's something very important and very powerful about understanding that what we consume, the pictures we look at, the stuff we read, affects our mental and cognitive health. If they get that, the better it will be. I think also, really critically, and again, so much of our research shows this, you need to tell them that you understand their tech is important. Because, of course, there's a wonderful side to tech. It is the place where they meet and make friends and learn and grow. So if they feel that you get that, they're much more likely to come to you with a problem without the fear that you're going to blame a phone or a tablet, but instead have a more nuanced discussion about how to deal with what's going on. And I think, finally, and perhaps most importantly, we need to put pressure on policymakers and corporations to stop using our behavioral instincts against us. Um, yeah, do you know what? In some ways, the genie is out of the bottle. It's true. You know, we, we've got this information now. There's no going back. But you know what? I don't think these companies are out there to harm us. This is what I think has happened. I think that they've found themselves in this kind of inadvertent arms race, right? Where this information is out there. So if they want to compete in the marketplace, they feel compelled to use it. But what if they used it for good? 
We know now that some of these features that I've spoken about are being used to improve health behaviors, like staying on your medication or exercising. There are reports of anti-bullying apps that use the same notifications that keep kids checking their feeds so that to get them to send encouraging notifications. So we can now begin to think about how we use this technology and not just passively let it happen to us in the way that it's been. You know, I think for far too long, um, with the metrics for computer companies have just been about growing them and making them bigger and better. I think they need to begin to ask themselves if these technologies add value to the human experience and not just simply how humans can add value to these platforms. So, very simply, our children's world, be it online or off, becomes a much easier place to navigate when they understand how it works. And at the moment, there's a situation playing, played out on the online world where our children's instincts there can be used against them, you know, not just psychologically and emotionally, but biochemically as well. And I think that's why, as parents, we not only need to understand how these things work, but we need to help our kids understand how they work as well, so that ultimately, they can have the same experience that we did. Because you know what? The basics are all the same. The imperative to, to learn and make friends and, and to be liked. But if we get it right, then they can have a journey like ours. Yes, with twists and turns and ups and downs, but one that leads to a healthy, happy young adult that can navigate the adult world. Thank you very much.